to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. In the Old Testament, God describes his land of promise, the land that he has set aside for um, the descendants of Abraham to inhabit um, as a land that is flowing with milk and honey. Now, I don't propose having those two things together at the same time, but um, certainly those were words of description that, um, that were um, words that, that really spoke to the children of Israel. It was a very poetic description of Israel's uh, land that they were to inherit. Uh, it, it emphasized the fertility of the soil. Uh, it emphasized the, the, the bounty that awaited for God's chosen people to come and to inherit. It, it was a reference in the word milk that suggested that, that the livestock that they had, that the, the many animals could find pasture there, that there was plenty. And, and the reference uh, and the mention of honey suggested that, the, that there was vast farmland available, that, that the bees had plenty of plants to, to draw nectar from. And this reference is made no less than 16 times throughout the Old Testament. Milk refers to uh, something that is nourishing. It is a substance of provision. You, you can't just put some ingredients together and make milk. It's something that has to be provided. Honey is something that is sweet, that is considered uh, in, in some cultures to be a delicacy. And it, it is also a substance of provision. You, you can't just uh, put, put a few ingredients together and, and make honey. It, there's a process there. But both of these things require some type of, of harvest to acquire that product. Um, of course, you know, through uh, the, the gifts of, of technology, uh, those things are a little bit easier to acquire these days than they were, you know, thousands of years ago. Um, you know, up, probably up until the last uh, <clears throat> few decades, uh, you know, all those things had to be gathered and, and acquired by hand through, through manual labor. Now those, those things uh, can, can be acquired through machinery and, and, and through uh, other methods of, of farming. But the first mention that we find is in Exodus chapter 3. Uh, just to give you time, place, and setting, Moses is tending to uh, the animals. He's there, there in Midian, uh, and he's taking care of his father-in-law's flock. And as he looks off into the distance, he sees a bush that has caught on fire. And instead of running for the hills, he hears his name called out of that bush. And he goes closer. And the voice of the Lord begins to speak to Moses from that burning bush. In verse 7 and verse 8 of Exodus chapter 3, the Lord says, to Moses, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their outcry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hebite, and the Jebusite. And so in those uh, two verses, we, we hear what the Lord has said to Moses. The Lord says that he sees the oppression of his people. He hears their cries, and he is aware of their suffering. So that tells us from the very get-go that that the Lord sees us, he hears us, and he knows what situation 
that we find ourselves in. <clears throat> he goes on and he says at the beginning of verse 8, he says, so I have come down to rescue them. And when you think about God coming down to rescue, you can't help but think about Jesus Christ. How that God became a man, how that he came down to provide a way to rescue us. And so um, in these two verses, two things you will, I want to point out to you this morning. Before all the plagues, before all the things that, that the Lord um, did to show his strength, and to show his might, to encourage his people, and yet to, to show Pharaoh that, that Pharaoh was not the ruler of this world. Before all those plagues, the land of Egypt supported Israel quite well. If you remember the story of Joseph, how that, that Joseph was sold into slavery, how that he found his way down to Egypt, how that he was um, set over the affairs of Potiphar's house, and then uh, Potiphar's wife told a lie about him, and he was thrown into prison, and then he works his way up to be second in command in, in all of the land of Egypt. He's, he was pretty much the prime minister. Uh, the, the, the head administrator of the entire land, how that the Lord used him to, to, to guide the people because they were got to experience seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine, how that during those seven years of plenty and excess, the, the storehouses were filled with grain and, and, and precautions were made in preparation for the seven years of, of not so plenty. And, and, and as Joseph and then his family and his brothers uh, made their way during the famine down there and, and they stayed. And they began to grow in number and, 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 and the Pharaoh at the time became concerned that their number would outgrow the population of Egypt. So they began to enslave them, not employ them, but enslave them. And, and what became... Uh, population control turned into uh, pretty, pretty much physical abuse. They, they, they used them to, to build things and, and to work the land. And <clears throat> they did it in, in large number. Uh, you know, the Bible's not very clear as to whether they were individual slaves as, as to whether they actually had an owner that they worked for. I think it was more along the lines of, of just the entire community. They were, they were rounded up each and every morning, sent to the job sites, and, and herded back home in the evening, probably just a little bit after dark. But, but before all of those plagues, before the, 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 the oppression became so great, the, the land of Egypt supported Israel and the Egyptians very well. It was a land that, that um, was good for farming. And, and even the... the uh, Israelites were allowed to have their own personal crops where they grew their own vegetables and things like that in addition to the work that they would do for the Egyptians. But, but God called this new land, this, this land of promise, good and spacious. Not, not confined to a certain area where certain things would grow, but good and spacious. The Hebrew word translated good means pleasant, beautiful, and fruitful with an economic benefit. This is a description of the blessings of the land, referring especially to its uh, fertility and its productivity. And so not, not only were they going to, to be given this land, but it was a land that, that could support them and that they could have their own economy and not work for someone else, not be someone else's slave. And so that was would, would have been a description that would have excited uh, the, the people of Israel as God spoke to Moses. Uh, it, it pictures an abundance of grass, an abundance of fruit trees, an abundance of flowers where, where their livestock, their cows and their goats and, and the bees of the land would thrive and where the best uh, drink and food would abound. And that, and that was a place that was promised to them. God also describes uh, the land in very specific terms, geographically. He says it is the place of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hevite, and the Jebusite. 
And while God was simultaneously promoting the good things about the land, God mentions that there would be enemies in the land. They're going to have to remove those folks out of that place. And, and it's, it's a place that's going to have to be overcome. The nations that would be displaced by Israel from this land that, that flows with milk and honey were significant in, in number. They, were, they, they valued that land enough to fight for it and maybe even die for it. And they would. And so the, the Lord is, is very specific in the location of where Moses is going to lead these people. But he's also very specific in, in the type of land that this is. It's, it's, it's good land. It's spacious land. It's a land that, that is in abundance. It's a land that, that has everything provided that they would need to survive and that they would need to thrive. And so as Moses makes his way down and he convinces the people that, that the Lord has sent him and, and they get ready to go and the ten plagues you know, happen and and the final plague, and you have the Passover, and Pharaoh says, all right, get out of here. I don't want to see you anymore. And as they're heading out of town, he changes his mind. He says, wait a minute. There's too many of them to lose. we got to have them back. Regardless of all the loss, regardless of all the devastation we've just experienced, we got to have them back. I'm too proud of a man. And so after leaving Egypt by the dry ground, in the middle of the Red Sea, as it was separated, Moses and the nation of Israel find themselves on the southern edge of the Promised Land. Just, just under two weeks have passed since they left Egypt. And they get their first glimpse of this land that's flowing with milk and honey. Look in uh, Numbers chapter 13, if you will. Numbers chapter 13. Just a couple of books over from where you are now. <clears throat> so Moses and the people, as I said, find themselves on the southern edge of this promised land. And in Numbers chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, <clears throat> the Lord spoke to Moses. And he said, send out men for yourself to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am going to give the sons of Israel. You shall send a man from each of their father's tribes, every one a leader among them. And so the Lord told them, hey, go and check this place out. Go and have a look-see at this land that is going to become yours. Verse 18, this is what he says. See what the land is like and whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many. And how is the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? How are the cities in which they live? Are the people in open camps or are they in fortifications? Are they in walled cities? And how is the land? Is it productive or unproductive? Are there trees in it or not? And show yourselves courageous and get some fruit of the land. And this was the time and the season of the first ripened grapes. Verse 23, it says, Then they came to the valley of Eshcol, and from there they cut off a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two men, along with some pomegranates and figs. In verse 25, it says, When they returned from spying out the land, at the end of 40 days, they went on and came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. So they reported to Moses, to him, and said, We came into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. So not only did they see the land, but they had proof. They had evidence of the land. And 10 of those 12 spies that had left Egypt, they had crossed on dry ground in the middle of the Red Sea. They had made it to the 
to the southern edge of the land of promise in just under two weeks. And they go in there and they see the bounty that awaits them. They see how good it is. They see how abundant the things are. And they have the proof right there in their hands. And 10 of those 12 men says, we can't do it. We just can't do it. Joshua and Caleb were the only two that said, God can. 10 said, we can't, but two said, God can. And here's the tragic failure of these people. God had brought them right to the border of entering into this fullness of blessing. The abundant and rich life. It was there. All they had to do was go in and possess it. Make it theirs. God had already promised. God said, I will drive out the inhabitants from before you. You just go in and take the land. See, God's already prepared the way. All they have to do is go that way. The people at this point, they, they, they failed to enter in. They failed to enter because they allowed fear to dominate their heart instead of faith. Ten had fear and two had faith. Why is fear always in the majority? You know, we, we kind of use that, that word loosely in our everyday language. Well, I'm afraid if I don't go such and such, and then such and such will happen. Well, I'm afraid if I don't get up on time, I'll be late. You know, and all those kind of things. And we, and we talk in terms of, of fear, of being afraid. We don't let faith lead us and guide us. The Bible tells us to walk that we walk by faith, not by sight. What we see might scare us. But faith is, is evidence and hope in the unseen. We can't be afraid. We shouldn't be afraid of, of what we don't see. Sure, there is, there's an uncertainty when it comes to the unknown. But faith over fear triumphs every single time. Fear brings unbelief. And unbelief will rob you and keep you from that which God has already made available for you. He said, here's the land. Go in and take it. I'll make the way. They said, we can't do it. We can't do it. So the people got an uproar. They were so distraught. It said that they cried into the night. And all of those people wanted to stone Caleb and Joshua. Why have you brought us here? What's well, the land of milk and honey? This is where God wanted you to go. This is your place of promise. That's why they were brought here. One of the commentary writers that I really enjoy reading, Chuck Smith, he says, there are so many Christians today who have failed to enter into the full, rich life that God has for them. And he's not talking about wealth and privilege and all that kind of stuff. He's talking about a good spiritual life. He's talking about you growing in your relationship with God. He says they are living sort of a yo-yo Christian experience. They're high one day and down the next, and you never know what kind of a mood or spiritual mood they're going to be in. They have never entered into the full abundant life of the spirit that God wants for his children. Their life is one continued battle with the flesh. A constant roaming and wandering in the wilderness and never entering in to possess that full, rich land that God has promised for them. Instead of seeing God at work in a situation, we tend to focus on the things and the circumstances or the areas that we think are impossible. We look at it with eyes of fear instead of 
a heart of faith. If you look at where they had come from and where they were, Pharaoh giving in and, and, and letting them leave seemed impossible. Getting across the Red Sea with an army chasing them seemed impossible. Moving thousands and thousands of people from Egypt to Canaan seemed impossible. A virgin birth seemed impossible. Raising from the dead with a huge stone covering the en entrance to the, to the grave seemed impossible. Even being forgiven of, of all your wrongs, all your failures, all your shortcomings, your indiscretion might seem impossible. But Luke 137 clearly says nothing will be impossible with God. You look them up. Go find Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Ask them about impossible. You ask the lame, the, the crippled, the blind, the deaf, all the folks that Jesus healed, ask them about impossible. Ask one of the four or 5,000 who had bread and fish about impossible. Ask Noah about impossible. Ask Peter or James or John or any of the other disciples or even Paul about impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. So fast forward 40 years later. Ten said, we can't do it. Two said, God can. So 40 years later, and one generation of ancestry has expired. The people find themselves led to the edge of the promised land once again. They're back at Kadesh Barnea. And Moses is speaking to them and he's, he's instructing them as they prepare to finally go into the land and begin to take possession of it. Now Moses is not going to get to go in. His, his time on earth is about to expire as well. Joshua. Caleb and the, and the second generation of people that left Egypt. They're about to go in. And Moses says this in Deuteronomy chapter 11, beginning in verse 8. He says, You shall therefore keep every commandment which I am commanding you today, so that you may be strong and go in and take possession of the land into which you are about to cross to possess it. And so that you may prolong your days on the land which the Lord swore uh, to your fathers to give to them and to their descendants a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land into which you are entering to possess it is not like the land of Egypt from which you came, where you used to sow your seed and water it by your foot like a vegetable garden. But the land into which you are about to cross to possess it a land of hills and valleys drinks water from the rain of heaven. A land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are continually on it from the beginning even to the end of the year. And so as, as, as Moses is, is encouraging these people to go in and to possess this land of promise, this land of, of milk and honey, he reminds them that obedience is a is has a conditional promise attached to it. He says, keep every commandment that I command you today so that, so when, when they're obedient to the Lord, so that they may be strong and take possession of the land. And then he says, and in verse nine, and so that, you may prolong your days in the land. And so when they're obedient to what the Lord has commanded, they're going to have the strength to go in and take the land. And when they're obedient, once they've taken the land, they will have a long life in that land. So we see, again, that obedience comes with a conditional promise. But I like verse 10. The land 
into which you are entering to possess it. That means that, that, that it's going to be theirs. He said, it's, it's not like the land of Egypt from which you came, where you used to sow your seed and water it by your foot like a vegetable garden. See, in, in Egypt, they had to work. They were slaves. They worked all day doing whatever they did, you know, making bricks, other things to, to build stuff out of. And then late in the evening when they would get to return to their little village, to their little community, they would have to go out in the backyard or the front yard or wherever they had their little garden. And they would just have enough space to grow what they needed for them. Just enough to get by. And they would have to plant it themselves. They would have to tend it. And he said that you would have to water it by your foot. They had to make sure that it was taken care of so that they would be taken care of. But he says, the land that you're about to, to go in and to enter and to possess, it's not like the land of Egypt. Where you are now is not the same as where you were. If you're a child of God, where you are now shouldn't be the same as where you were. We need to remember that on the daily, each and every day. Every day with the Lord is a new day. Why, why is the land different than the land of Egypt? When he goes on and he says in verse 11 and 12, the land you are about to cross to possess, it's a land of hills and valleys. And it drinks water from the rain of heaven. And he goes on and he says, the land for which the Lord your God cares. They're not going to have to plant the seed and water it and make it grow. All those things are already growing there. The Lord is providing those things. They're just going to become stewards of it. They're, they're going to manage it. And it's going to be theirs. And he says, the eyes of the Lord your God are continually on it, even from the beginning to the end of the year. The Lord is the provider for the land, the land of milk and honey. His eyes are continually looking after the land. The entire calendar, with every season that comes, the Lord is, is the one who's providing these things that grows in this land. There's, there's not going to be one of those Israelites that will walk in there and say, I grew this, I did this, look what I've got. The Lord provided it all. If God can provide everything, for the land that it needs to produce in abundance. Can't he provide what you'll need to? And can't, can't he provide for us in his way to meet our needs, to make sure that we're taken care of so that when we look at ourselves in the mirror, it's not I did, mine, or look at me. He's responsible for who I am today. And that should be every one of our testimonies. Paul told the church at Philippi in Philippians 4, 19, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. The riches in Christ Jesus are supplied in abundance. And I know that because Jesus said, I came so that they would have life and they would have it abundantly. That abundant life simply means to have the power to live the life that God would have you to live. And that would be a more abundant life in Christ. So I'm not talking about paycheck to paycheck kind of life. I'm talking about a spiritual life. I'm not talking about your financial life. It could lead to that. But I'm talking about how, how you interact with your Savior. 
your relationship with the God of creation. A good and spacious life. A life that overflows with milk and honey. Abundance from the provision of God himself. A blessed and productive life. You know, throughout scripture, those terms that refer to food are often used. Milk and honey. David said in Psalms 34, 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who trusts in him. Milk's good. Chocolate milk. Milkshake. It's good. Honey is good. You ever put honey on a peanut butter sandwich? She told me. Honey on your pancakes or a waffle? It's good. The writer of Hebrews talks about a blessed and productive life. He said in Hebrews 6 verse 7, for the ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and produces vegetation is useful for those whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. We're blessed in order to be a blessing. That was That's God's economy. That's how God set it up to begin with, with Abraham and his descendants. When he said, I will make you a great nation, I will give you a promised land was to be a blessing because they were blessed by God. For the Christian, heaven, heaven is our land of promise, our land of milk and honey. Jesus promised us in John chapter 14, in my Father's house are many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you because I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I am coming again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you also will be. Place of promise. Good and spacious place. The description of the promised land as a land flowing with milk and honey is a beautifully graphic way of highlighting the richness of the land where God was about to bring his people out of slavery in Egypt and into this prosperous land of freedom and blessing and, and, and abundance. Just think how much more rich heaven is going to be because God has provided for us a way out of slavery of sin to be free from the slavery of sin and to live in his spirit here and with him there our land of milk and honey let's pray father we thank you so much for for just the opportunity to look into your word father to be reminded of the provision of abundance that you have prepared for us. Father, it is ours for the taking. We are at the very edge. All we have to do is go and possess it. Lord, forgive us for living that yo-yo Christian life of ups and downs, spiritual moodiness. Lord, we're, we're, we're like a broken thermometer at times. Lord, I pray that, that we would live in faith and not out of fear. Lord, I just pray that if there's someone here today that these verses have spoken to their heart, Father, that they would come and take possession of the abundant life that you have ready and waiting for them. Father, forgive us from the times that... that that we have gone up to the edge of a blessing 
and we've looked at it and we've surveyed the situation and we said, no, it's too big. We can't do it. It's when you've clearly said, I've already done it and it's yours. So Father, we just ask that you move here today and we praise you and we thank you for who you are and what you do. In Christ's name. Thank you, Baptist Temple. Turn to 308. Let us stand. Page 308.